Okay. Let's see here now. I think we're on the air. Just gonna wait for a confirmation from uh, Jamal, the wondrous tech person. We are, we are on air. Ventilating, all right, everybody. Well, so it's about 6.10. We're really happy to have anyone and everyone who's in the Digital Ethers with us for this screening. Thank you for your patience. Um, you know, technical issues as it goes, keeps us on our feet. <laughs> we got no sweat on our brows. We're, we're ready for this. So um, I'm just going to jump in and um, offer some acknowledgments. And then maybe we'll have a cute little intro of the artists. And then we'll just get right into our screening. Because that's what we're here for. In case you're wondering, we're having a screening this evening. It's a premiere of a series of short videos by emerging phenomenal, brilliant artists in this city. Like, y'all get ready. Um, exploring themes of transformative justice. I would say abolition is in there. Self and community healing, how we survive the end of the world as we have known it and how we imagine better possibilities and better futures for ourselves and our communities. Uh, mutual aid, oh my goodness. This, this screen is gonna take you on a wonderful emotional journey. Um, so welcome, thank you for being here. Uh, Acknowledgements. I want to acknowledge the traditional and contemporary territories we are on here, the Great Lakes Basin, the Gathering Place, the Garonto, many names, and stewarded by many different nations, in particular the Huron Wendat Haudenosaunee, and in particular the Seneca settled on Kobechanonk River, and the Ojibwe peoples, in particular the Mississauga of the Credit River, who were the last folks settled here in colonial times. And I should shout out the Petun and Metis peoples too, and a lot of love to the waterways. Um, Want to say um, happy spring equinox and Naurus Mubarak. Um, Want to give a serious shout out to the lineages of transformative justice, the archive, the histories of transformative justice, healing justice, restorative justice um, practiced by black and indigenous people, folks of color, uh, women, in particular working against gender-based violence and uh, supporting their families to have safety and wellness, uh, the disability justice community, poor folks, criminalized folks, sex workers. I want to acknowledge prisoners and in general, the abolitionist movement for all that they've contributed in principle and practice to the movement of trans or for transformative justice. Woo! Yes, I hope that makes you tingle. Um, I just want to name that um, these videos were made in a six month artist residency. It was all at home for the most part. Imagine making videos about transformative justice from your homes or in the middle of a pandemic when it's very difficult to gather. So these artists like really made artwork from the heart with deep vulnerability and courage in like against the odds <laughs> in all ways. And also I should say that the themes that people are exploring are, are very personal. Uh, both like uh, intimate and also about our kinships, about our communities who also experience uh, criminalization and incarceration. And I just want to also acknowledge that today uh, is the National Day of Action uh, to free them all. And by that, I mean folks who are incarcerated, and that is both in de immigration detention centers and juvenile detention centers, prisons, uh, federal, provincial, Etc. all folks who are being detained against their will. Um, and I just, I wanna shout out all the people across so-called Canada who organized today, who had, were in the streets. And so we're really happy to also be, you know, be a part of that organizing today. Um, and maybe later I'll, I'll, I'll read off the, the calls to action because they're pretty beautiful. So with that, my name is Nadie Tremblay. Um, I had the pleasure of co-organizing this program with my dear colleague, passing it off. We're going to use our digital circle technique, okay, everybody, and introduce ourselves. Okay, cool. So I'm tapping Jamal. Oh, oh. Hello, hello. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Jamal. Um, I'm the as associate artist or digital media associate artist here at Sketch. Um, and yeah, I am a photographer, videographer, dancer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Next, who anyone wants to go next? Oh. <laughs> you get to tap uh, them in. Yeah. I'll go next. I'll go next. Yeah, I just tapped myself in. Wow, egotistical. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my name is Paul Daniel Torres or Danny, depending how many know me. Uh, I am a uh, writer, director, uh, poet, and uh, youth worker, and sometimes I act. And uh, Happy to be here and happy to share space with such amazing artists and people. And uh, thank you so much for everybody that's come by. And yeah, blessings and salad dressings. And I guess I'll tap uh, Greg. Hey, it's me. Thanks everybody for coming through. Appreciate it. Um, so Greg, I'm one of the artists here. I like to work in lots of different media and whether that's poetry, painting, drawing, or for today, it's a short animated film. And I kind of just like to make stuff that makes people feel very human and vulnerable. That's kind of where a lot of my work centers around. And yeah, if you came out here and took time out of your Saturday, very, very big thank you for doing so. And I'm going to pass over to Milan. Hi, I'm Milan, um, inspiring filmmaker. I'm passionate about people and the stories that make us up. And um, yeah, I'm excited to watch our films together. And thanks everyone for being here. And I'll pass it to River Jordan. Hello everyone, I'm River Jordan. I'm a multimedia artist. And today I am here visually as just some text on a screen. Um, I specialize in documentary film. I love the human experience and hopefully today you get to see that through this stream and passing you on back to Natty. Sweet, everyone went? Okay, cool. Um, so I guess um, I, it also feels important to say, yeah, big thanks to Sketch for supporting and hosting this residency and um, leveraging tech and um, money to pay artists on a rare because, oh my God, artists, we need to live and pay our rent and stuff. It's nice to get paid. Um, and I want to give a shout out to uh, CFMDC, Canadian Filmmakers Distribution Center. They're going to help us distribute this work. And so that could be one place you could find these individual videos or this reel in the future. And also I want to give a shout out to Charles Free Video, Artist Run Center, uh, for also supporting us with uh, hooking up all the residents with memberships for a full year and just being lovely people. Um, yay! Community held Artist Run. Media, woo! And the people stayed home. And they learned to listen and slow down. And they met themselves again and again. Some saw their shadows and hugged them tightly. Each time, sensing something anew, lost deep and budding at the surface, and they tried new things and old things. Some drank more water, walked with nature, read stories, cooked meals for their loved ones, made art and danced as if no one watched. Some meditated, grieved, exercised and sang. Some set asynchronous texts, organized themselves with others and took long, deep breaths. And time had no hold and they began to be differently. And so you can still find the people yesterday, today, and tomorrow, planting each other's seeds, co-evolving, and staying home. It's going back to that original form of, 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 of justice, right? That we meet with you, we guide you, we help you, we give you direction, we let you know what your, your actions or your, your, your words or what you're doing, how it impacted other people, how you can take change, giving you the space to do the change in, 
showing you all the supports and then you fail. And then we do the same thing again, right? We reach out to you again and we, we offer that support. We hear your reasoning. We give you new light into to how this is impacting as well. And then they do that again. And there are people that will do that. So it's, it's, it's got to be embedded into transformative justice that there is a point that when you know there is no transitioning there's no transforming then we have to hold people accountable but up until that space yes we are obligated we are directed to provide those supports for people to give them all of our love and attention and compassion and um, knowledge to help them do those changes to be walking beside them you know, not just throwing them out there, but to be standing beside them and supporting them. But in the long run, it comes down to them, right? It comes down to where is your input into into what we're offering you? Are you aware of it? Are you aware of these are the steps that are, are taken from a traditional old, old style point to the nowadays point of, you know, maybe people want to give you five chances or six chances. Right. It depends on what their nation's protocols is and what their directions have been given to them from their lineages to follow. Right. But bottom line is, it's the person's openness to receiving those methodologies of transformative justice. Right. And are they willing to put the work into it? Not only um, uh, intellectually, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Right? It's got to be all balanced within that indigenous medicine wheel encompassing those four parts of a being. Right, You can't just give us your words. You can't just give us the, the sadness that you feel because you know you've done something that needs to be addressed and, and behaviors have to change. But what are you going to do to make the change? Right, What actions are you going to put into place so that we can support you? Right? What do you think you need? Right? And sometimes it is that hard, hard choice to say, you know, we've given you numerous op- you know, uh, um, opportunities and you're not there yet. So come back again when you're ready. But go and do your work. Right? Give them a time period, a year, six months, whatever it may be. But in between that time, we have other people that we have to dedicate our time and our energies and our supports to that are struggling because you're taking away that opportunity by us having to continue to talk to you without your input, without your action, your accountability, your ownership. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know, that's, that's, that's the way I've been dealing with stuff and I've been taught to deal with it, but to always use that as a last resort, right? Because We never want to not be able to offer help. So we leave it to that person to go and do what you need to do, right? Obviously, you're not willing to make the changes right now, but go do what you need to do, but not involving community where they can continue to be harmed by your actions. Yeah. Because it's not just you, right? It's it's all of community. I would describe myself as like a creative person. I mean, I'm in high school, things are like I'm doing, (laughs) doing high school things. And I'm really just trying to like learn about the world and like connect to other people using art. And I think like I found art in the past few years and I started like going really deep with it and I think through that I really like found a passion in a way that I never really have before. I'm a teenager. I half Asian, 
queer and just trying to just trying to like spread my art to the world. Hello, uh, my name is Dessa Ely. I'm a 16 year old half Chinese artist. Um, I attend Etobicoke School of the Arts in Toronto. I'm working on a series right now about being mixed Asian where um, I'm going around essentially and documenting other mixed Asian people on Polaroid film and then using a process called emulsion lift where you essentially cut open the Polaroid and immerse it in hot water and the actual image itself lifts off the page. It's made of gelatin so it's very vulnerable and it essentially like sticks to it sticks to the first thing it touches. It's kind of about like vulnerability and community. And I layer those images which become transparent on top of images of their grandparents. I think grandparents are a really like significant thing for me and my generation of mixed Asian people. Most of them are the people who immigrated or they were born in uh, their native country. And um, I find that there's a lot of like disconnect between me and my grandparents, uh, which almost represents the disconnect between me and my culture, which is something I'm trying to change right now. So layering them on top of their grandparents almost um, blends their faces together and they kind of become one. And you see both of their similarities and their differences and almost unite that, which both symbolizes connection and disconnection. And I think that as like a mixed person in this world, you're kind of, everyone has a lot of internalized racism. And I always grew up like wishing I was white. Um, and because I was mixed, it was really easy for me to like pretend that I was just white. And I found myself like pushing away my culture almost. And then Recently, I've been wishing I could like reconnect with that, so I'm kind of trying to do that through this process. And being mixed is a really uh, specific experience. And as I'm going around documenting all of these other mixed Asian people, I'm having these conversations and I'm building this community of other mixed people around me who have the same experiences as me. And through that, I almost like was able to find that community and find that culture that I was missing because everyone else is kind of going through their own version of that too. Um, so this, pro this project has not just been about making this for me, but it's also about creating this community around me and finding these ways to connect to other people and hopefully connect to people even if I don't include them in the series and hopefully be able to share that mixed experience to make that a bit easier for us. Because my art practice, I try to um, like replicate my specific experiences in a medium. I kind of like allow that to like create kind of a version of myself and seeing that outside of myself and like creating that outside of myself gives me like a way to put things into perspective and like get to know myself better and like what I need to do to get out of a situation or a problem. I stumbled across like my practices in like a lot of weird ways. Um, the chlorophyll prints specifically, I was doing some research on artists and I found Ben Don who invented that process and I was like super drawn to his work and I found myself just like so attached to it. Um, and I put a lot of thought into like what my mediums are. So that's kind of always changing as well with like the topics that I'm working with. They kind of take on their own form. Like not all of the aspects of my work are things I can predict. And I've also made um, like chlorophyll prints in the past, which is um, you get leaves and an image printed on clear acetate and you layer those in a frame and leave it in the sun and the sun will like bleach the parts that are exposed. That material is ever changing and I'm using life itself as a material and with this series I'm using 
community as a material. I kind of use art as like a tool for coping in a way. Like I really have been using art as like a way to process um, how I deal with loss in like a really general sense. A few years ago, I was like in exploring like my parents' divorce. And then I was working through, like now I'm working through my experiences being like a person of color in this world and what that means and like specifically being mixed. Arts do really teach you to be more empathetic towards others. And in my practice, like I use arts as a tool to um, learn more about myself, which I think is like the basis of healing. I think a lot of my healing has come through art and it's really just like analyzing what's going on and understanding it and it's kind of this really beautiful way to like better yourself as a person and like the arts community also plays a big role in that like you're surrounded by these people who are willing to help you heal and help you deal with these issues whether it's through art or just through like love art I'm kind of like forcing myself to be vulnerable which like I have a really hard time with and I know like a lot of people have a really hard time with. Almost a way for me to overcome loss or overcome growing up or overcome um, my internalized racism or all of these things that help me become a better person. So it's both lets me create better relationships with the people around me because I have a better relationship with myself and understand myself, which will set me up to be way more successful in life because I know what I want to do and I know what makes me happy and I don't have to worry about um, keeping those things inside because they already exist in these like tangible objects because I've made them to be exactly that. And in terms of like Asian and mixed kids in the future, I know that I've dealt with a lot of like internalized racism and wishing I was white. Um, and it's really been a journey that I'm still going through right now to conquer that and to embrace who I am. But I do hope that one day uh, we live in a world where people don't have to go through that because we're in a society that truly accepts people for who they are no matter what their race or sexuality or gender is. Um, as empowering as this journey has been, I just wish that I didn't have to go through it in the first place. Um, and I do hope that my kids and the people of the future have figured that out in some way because that would be very beautiful. <laughs> Super well said. Okay. Super well said. I know myself to be a creature of the in-between, always seeking terrifying heights, Wanton, what this human hand has not been taught to hold. When I begin to wake, it happened again. That feeling that you, beloved, had stood over me all night, keeping watch. These bones are an enemy of gravity. They fight each other in dreams. Though there is a knowing between us, the intelligence to bleed and stale my nail beds, the audacity to be so vivid, to appear to me like my very own insides, crimson, underestimated. The conflict is fought behind my eyes, and this is how weights are made. My task upon waking is to stop the war. I do want to stop it.
Step one, a drink of water and I call myself an ocean. Today I speak in prayers and wrap my tongue around answers. I drop my chin, a bow of reverence. Lips part as salt water gathers at the corners of my eyes. I find something, then I forget. Go back to step one and repeat. The deed is never done, but the body is only really still when its turn here is over. I welcome my energy back home into me and lovingly release all that is not back into the earth. As my souls touch the smooth wooden floor, my glowing root sparks a messenger in my spine that I am here, I am alive. A touch of grace creeps into the depths of my belly. My acts are not solutions. Solutions are not real. They do, however, put a pause to the terror I don't know someone who likes to be afraid. Here, in this hollow opening, sits a golden sunflower, glistening with hope and glory. The stem reaches down, 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 receiving and feeding nectar with the sun at the center of the earth. I travel south, down the pathways within my throat, past my supple tongue, where a flower awaits between the boundaries of my collarbones. With a gentle sway of my outbreath, surrounding petals unravel, revealing its brilliant core. A soothing hum serenades my chest, feeling the space between each rib expand. I bring my hands to touch, fingerprints kiss together, thumbs resting at my breastbone. Sensations of praise ricochet in and around my whole being. A breath of gratitude before my eyelids part. Thank you, I whisper. Step four. A group of thoughts start to bleed onto paper. The seed and the egg are quite the same thing I've come to understand. Thank you, I whisper. All burdens release as I rise tall, greeting the day with a light heart and brave feet, ready and willing to begin again.
I was thinking of memories reliving instances inside of my mind, though some are mistaken, products of this pink fleshy hard drive. Freshly I cried, even thought I might die, for all of the times that I did not have time. I was thinking of memories, reliving instances inside of my mind, seeing so much clearer having been washed by the time. Feelings I cannot touch or be touched by again still stand present with me like a quality friend. I was thinking of memories, but these kind sublime, innocent and sweet, oh childhood's treat. To walk an old prince which my feet have outgrown Like different rooms inside the same home Reliving instances inside of my mind Despite any woes, these things remain mine Memories I was thinking of memories, reliving instances inside of my mind, though some are mistaken, products of this pink fleshy hard drive. Freshly I cried, even thought I might die, for all of the times that I did not have time. I was thinking of memories, reliving instances inside of my mind, seeing so much clearer having been washed by the time. Feelings I cannot touch or be touched by again still stand present with me like a quality friend. I was thinking of memories, but these kind sublime, innocent and sweet, oh childhood's treat. To walk an old prince which my feet have outgrown Like different rooms inside the same home Reliving instances inside of my mind Despite any woes, these things remain mine Memories I do this thing where I look at my life like a story and I split it into chapters and it's my coping mechanism. It's how I make sense of the world around me. And personally, I think the world is made out of two things, atoms and stories. And so what this allows me to do is that when bad things happen, I can tell myself this only serves to enhance the narrative of my life. That great obstacles make great stories. A time with a lot of great obstacles was um, my last chapter, ages 17 and 22, which I'm not very much a fan of. In that time, I felt anger and hatred to such a depth that I was scared that I would lose myself. I woke up every day in spite like I had a vendetta and I did. I got sick. People I loved got sick. People I loved left. People I loved died. I was used dismissed and displaced and all the places that I thought were going to be safe and were going to heal me were the places where I got hurt the most. There was no sense of safety. I felt like a caged animal and I came to the conclusion that the world is set up so it hurts you and while you hurt, you hurt others and so forth and so forth. A cycle of pain that we're meant to be stuck in. I became somebody I never thought I would be. Did things that I never thought I would do. I hated myself. I felt worthless, useless, and hopeless. I just wanted to tear my chest open and rip out the pieces of myself that I hated that were in pain. There was this big intersection on my walk to school, and every time I walked through it, I told myself, hey, if it happens, it happens. I spent a lot of hazy nights on friends' couches because I was afraid what I would do if I was left alone. I wanted to fucking die. So that's where the chapters come from. I don't like to end them on sour notes because if all my chapters end in sour notes, I'll stop writing. 
So when bad things happen, they get put in the middle because it isn't a sad ending. It's a great obstacle to be overcome. That's how I keep my story going. I'm hard of hearing my left ear because when I was three, I put Q-tips in my ears pretending to be the Iron Giant like they were antennae. Reenacting a scene, I fell down and put a hole through my eardrum. I wear blazers because it makes me feel like Jimmy Stewart in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington or It's a Wonderful Life. My first run-in of suicidal thoughts, I didn't kill myself because I hadn't watched The Avengers yet. I am my stories. I am my story. I'm a dork. I am a child. I am a, I am naive. And that's what I was afraid of losing. That's what I am afraid of losing. But it's how I stay alive. Because stories taught me that as long as you keep going, you'll get there. My hope. My hope is me. My smile. My playfulness in the face of adversity. That's me. If there isn't hope, I don't think life is worth living. The day that I lose hope and give myself the cynicism and hatred, you're not seeing me anymore. That's the death of my soul. And the death of my soul is the death of me. So stories give me hope, making my life a story is where I find hope. So for as much as I hated myself, I kept that child and that hope alive. Because when he goes, I go. And as of right now, I don't want to go. I want to keep writing. Sleeping on the floor, cold nights for you knocking at your door. I ain't never took life for a joke. Try to take my homie, I'm a blow. When I look retrospectively at the treatment of black youth going way back, say going back to 70s, and the treatment of black youth by police, people know who are mature men and women. When we look at what you stop, the 13 division, at 14 division. A black youth being criminalized by the system. The treatment of black youth by police officers. Everybody wrap their hands in unity. Hold each other in unity. Okay, the, the, the criminal justice system, the educational system, all the systems were predominantly white. You know, you can talk about the jury system when a, 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 a black youth is arrested by a white police officer. He goes to the station, being interviewed, a sergeant that is white. Petty crime should be released. Could, should, should be released at the station. So no, they don't release him. They put him in jail. Then he goes in front of a white judge the following day or two days after. There's a big hearing. Okay? So he, ha he has no lawyer. All right, due to counsel may speak for him, a white due to counsel. By this time, if his parents does not arrive in court, he's, from his arrest to the court, he's not seen by anybody of his own culture or color. He might be in jail several weeks before he comes for a hearing. His parents might appear. They may not release that young person to the parents. He's gone to trial in front of a white judge, a white prosecutor. And if he's lucky enough, he might have a black judge, but normally a white, a, a white lawyer, a black lawyer. In most instances, it's a white lawyer. So that first, that young person is, seems alienated, seems at a loss to find, now who is here, who has my interest? And there are some cases that are bizarre. You know, looking back at a lot of cases, you know, we find that the system is very unjust.
May we have peace. In the shooting of um, Rick Shank, okay, and um, another person that he shot, uh, Ian Coley. This officer shot Ian Coley. Never spoke about the reason why he shot Ian Coley. It took him 18 months before he spoke to the Special Investigations Unit, and he was never charged. And Ian Shanks is a white police officer. A white police officer shooting Ian Coley. Took okay. 18 months. The same officer, two years later, shot Hugh Dawson 10 times. And killed him. And killed him. So this officer kills two black persons, and is still a police officer. Still, he's still practicing and Well, he's still a police officer. He is not charged with the death of Hugh Dawson. Uh, there, has, there has only been one conviction. Nobody was convicted in the case of Bud Evans. Nobody was convicted in the case of um, Albert Johnson. The case of um, Michael Reed Lawson, nobody was convicted in that case. Cook, no conviction. The only case that there was a conviction was in the case shooting of Jonathan Howell. Jonathan Howell was shot by a police officer. However, they did not say whether the charge was, you know, uh, attempted murder or, or, or aggravated assault. The officer was charged with careless use of firearm. And he was guilty. And the same judge that found him guilty gave him an absolute discharge. He had, absolute. There was no penalty to him. No penalty. For that thing. And in the case of Sophia Cook, the officer in that case, Sophia Cook was a young lady in a car with a seatbelt on, seated in the car, and she was shooting her back. The officer was charged with a careless use of a firearm. On, her char on the charge sheet, there was no mention of anyone getting injured in that incident. For 30 years, I have worked with many of you who are gathered here today, working to bring changes to the criminal justice system of this city, of this province, in this country. Our efforts have been tremendous. We have had some changes, but the killings of our young people continues. We have had many problems within the criminal justice system, within education, immigration and in the general administration of the government of this country. Our efforts to bring about changes have been impeded by the obstinacy of people in power who do not want changes in this country. The racism is evident in all aspects of our society, but we have pledged that we will make a difference in this country for our children and for posterity. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The children always fight for you. Love you. Love you. Stay strong. Stay proud. Love you. Love you. Stay strong. 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 St
I don't fuck up so much on my way to come in on And I done lost so much So proud that I didn't give up Just was still in the cell Yeah, he about to do five And so hoes in my body So proud that I still alive Be ready to die I know I'm ready to stop. I put that shit on the guy. I do that shit for the guy. Take the realize and realize and realize. These niggas rapping about they fantasy, they fantasize. Every day I'm waiting for Lefty to hit me up at five. These niggas talking shit, but they don't know that suicide. To see everybody's work oh my goodness my heart is beating from that work <sighs> um there's a lot of good like chatter on the on the youtube chat which is lovely um letting y'all know in the youtube world that we're gonna explore a few questions over here i i, I got a couple prepared and that gives you time to uh, think about some questions burning questions that you want to ask these emerging filmmakers for social change um, but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna kick us off. Actually, let's just take one second and just like twinkle fingers of love to Jamal for just pushing through twinkle fingers of love. Also loud, loud applause. Thank you, Jamal, pushing through. <laughs> okay. It's also been, I just also gonna take a second to say, it's been such a pleasure working with Jamal. I've known him for a couple of years. We've done a couple of media arts programs, but this really took the cake. It was 
so lovely. Am I right? To that effect, I want to say, um, and I, I think I would, I'm, I'm maybe quoting Milen uh, from our last session, I, uh, that I'm sure you experienced that the works are very raw, they're very personal, emotional, intimate. Um, and yeah, Milen, I feel like you said, like we created a space together as a group uh, over six months to hold everybody's just like wavering sense of being anchored in this wild world and grappling with all, all of the issues uh, around us and the violence around us and also trying to imagine transformative justice today and in the future. Um, and yeah, I just wanna thank all of the artists, both for the experience of being in this residency together and the like tenderness that we held with each other and for just like the brilliance and heart that you brought to your work. <sighs> oh my God, I can't catch my breath here. Okay, seriously. Oh. So I, I wanted to ask, um, okay, it's a two part question. You can answer whatever you want, but one, I would love to know um, what transformative justice means to you, like in principle and in practice, uh, and if that, ha that has changed throughout this residency. Uh, and I, I think I would add on to that, you know, uh, what does this video mean to you in that broader context? Because again, the framing of this residency was exploring transformative justice. So, Maybe start with TJ and then into the video, what it means for you at this point. Who would like to go first? Go for it, Danny. Uh, yeah, I think for me, um, transformative justice for me is kind of uh, looking at the overall histories of the world, understanding the root causes of problems, and then moving forward to, um, to solve those problems and stuff like that. And kind of realizing in the fact that uh, the world needs a lot more love and a lot more healing and stuff like that. Uh, I also think for me, transformative justice means, um, I think for me personally, uh, I have a really like uh, internal and personal interpretation of it. And for me, like, before we can make like actionable changes uh, outside in the world, it's about like, what is the healing that you can do within oneself so you can go forth and make those actions. So I think for me, it's the fact that um, kind of, uh, kind of like realizing like um, the trauma uh, that's happened in my life and intergenerational uh, but in my life of trying to navigate, uh, trying to navigate as institutions based in white supremacy and trying to navigate whiteness and how that has like affected me. And then for me, the video was kind of like reflecting on that and trying to move forward from it. Cause I think like, um, sometimes again, like we get caught up in so much of the details and, and the information of like what we need to do to go forward that I think sometimes we forget kind of the, um, the emotional bits behind it. You know, what do we need to do as like on our solo dolo when we're by ourselves to kind of change and to grow as human beings and especially to, to heal? Because I think like um, the world as is, uh, is kind of like, like I, I, I don't know if I say in the poem, but I think I said in the draft of the poem, but like the world as is, I feel like sometimes it's kind of like designed to hurt you. And so that you hold on to your hurt and then um, you end up hurting other people because you're hurt. And I think like that's how the powers that be stay in power because we're like getting hurt and then we're hurting other people. And I think for me, that's what transformative justice is. It's that love and the healing to stop that cycle of pain, whether that cycle of pain be like someone hurting you or like that cycle of pain being like the divisions caused by intergenerational trauma that like stop solidarity from happening between different types of people so i think for me personally it's just kind of like uh i was like trying to do like um like a little investigation to myself being like okay cool how did this abusive relationship mess me up how did institution like how did education the educational system mess me up and stuff like that and like life and like how do i move from that so yeah but i'm gonna pass it off to milen now um yeah, I feel exactly what you're you're um, going on about, Danny. Especially like, okay, my con my concept of um, transformative justice is 
like plainly in principle, I think it's about um, getting at harm and violence at the root. Um, and I think the folks who have practiced transformative justice in the past and um, the extensive body of literature and just like practitioners that I've been exposed to um, while being at Sketch has really like um, helped reshape how I think about like violence. I used to think of it as like a very top down like process that's like enacted um, against us by the state. And when we really get at the root of a lot of violence that happens in the world, um, it becomes possible because all of us in ways are participating in like a particular type of culture that allows um, violence to like reproduce itself. Um, and so before coming into the this residency, um, I have like had been slowly growing my understanding of TJ through like my own like friends holding me accountable and introducing me to this like concept um, and my exposure like through different programs at Sketch. And then it's been growing over the course of this residency to like, um, and just because the pandemic allowed it to really like take in how, um, how we are with each other um, and with ourselves really makes all the difference. And that's like something I've explored in the video. Um, I think like there's all of these um, different social forces that are like materially and emotionally like scarring our collective like spirit and body and mind. And like, even when we're in isolated, um, in isolation, like during this pandemic, there are still, I think, little shifts that we can all make towards our own healing and collective healing. Um, and it takes a lot of time and like constant retrying um, and like a, a commitment to um, interrogate ourselves and our participation in like this culture um, that makes ourselves disposable and others and that just allows the big evil state forces to continue to reproduce harm at larger scale. So yeah, that's what TJ, TJ to me is like understanding like violence and inequality at just like an interpersonal level so that we could actually um, transform and change because that's the area that we can control. Um, I'll pass it to River Jordan. Can you please repeat the original question? Yeah. Um, so it was a question about, it was a two-part question, but I think uh, the first part being about transformative justice, just how, what, what that means to you, how you understood that uh, before the residency started, and it, have you noted any shifts throughout the residency or at this, you know, at this stage in your, in your work? Mm, I don't think I experienced a large shift. Um, definitely going through the residency through COVID, during COVID and seeing how as a society we, we've been like constructed to be isolated, to um, be self-obsessed, um, to focus on our own um, our own reality and not uh, the connection between different bodies, different spirits and such. Um, so for me, TJ is about realizing that uh, a human is a part of humanity uh, as a group and how to rebuild that, which, that connection, which has been purposely destroyed through different systems of oppression. Um, so yeah, and definitely with my video, it was just like being able to watch the, the same system happening over and over again for generations. Okay, passing on. Greg, Jamal. Yeah, so, uh, um, 
So it's just like transformative justice before and after, like insights, is that the question? Or just what it means to you, what it has meant to you. If you notice shifts, that's cool, but also just what um, it means to you, because that's the framing for this. I, I think mostly for, for me in particular, it's, uh, it's about community, you know? And I think um, when I was like younger as a teenager, the place where I found community was with a lot of, um, people who would get up to like crime and stuff just because we would look out for each other, you know? So it's like knowing that I'm safe and welcome there. That was a strong sense of community, but that, that would also put me in situations that weren't ideal. And so then I think as I got older and I started working yeah, in community spaces, like I've, I've helped with classes at this place called uh, Jayu, which I'll plug here. Please check them out. They're great. Um, they're a great community space for like, teaching youth or young adult like creative skills in, with a social justice framework and also as kind of like an art therapy lens. And I found that super, I found that so like magical of an experience like being around all these people who are just coming to learn something and sharing space, like to be kind to each other. And it's like, damn, like if me or, or you know, people I knew growing up like had this when we were younger, like how differently things might've turned out. Um, so I think in, in spaces where you're able to facilitate like kindness, you know, like there's so much grief and sadness in life already that you can just give people a little bit of, you know, joy and, and something healthy to have it. It really goes a long way, I, I think. So that, that's how I would, how I think of transformative justice is like, you know, if you're walking down the street and you smile at somebody, nine times out of 10, they'll smile back at you, right? So when you get to make these spaces where everybody comes together and they say, okay, I'm going to leave my like toxic stuff at the door. I'm not going to be super aggressive or confrontational. I'm going to try to recognize where I'm, where my shortcomings are as an individual in, in terms of communicating or, or socializing with people. And that like, you'll do the same. And I think that, which I've, I've learned through the last couple of months with all of you is like really, really powerful, you know, in terms of it, it's, you know, transformative for lack of a better word it, it really does do that having that kind of space for people love it, love it. thanks y'all for those answers um i'm gonna ask another question i'm drawing from the um, youtube chat thanks everybody in the youtube world there um and this is gonna go out to everybody in this chat including you jamal get ready you're next actually um and it's just you know what what do you think is the import what is the role of the artist for social change? What is the role of art in social change and social justice work? Hmm, I, I can't really think of a complex answer other than it's like, it's, it's a voice, I feel. You know, it's, it's like a way to communicate or like translate something that I feel sometimes just cannot be translated. Um, like yeah translated on a level that is that is digestible to everyone um yeah I feel like it's like I I like I'm trying to like think of moments and every I feel like every single moment that I kind of think of in my head or flashback in my that I think about right now is just like it's always been in a way to like it all, art has always been in a way to like kind of communicate and give of or kind of like project a voice yeah in terms of social change um yeah like I see it I like I, I generally I really see it and even even in the forms of like like art practice as like on a professional level or I, like even there's there's I feel like there's always you know like it it always speaks to someone or something in in whatever form it takes and yeah like the only thing i can really think of is that it's like it's like a form of communication um even when it's not being used to communicate it's still communicating something um and yeah that's kind of the connection i see with art <laughs> sweet so i'm gonna i'm gonna go in this order i'm gonna tap in milan then danny then river jordan and then greg because that's our circle okay cool and i might toss a thing in there too okay the the question was the role of the artist in social 
Um, Role of the artist in social change and social justice. Yeah. And yeah, what's that look like? Um, I, I One thing that's coming to mind is that um, Tony, Tony K. Bambara quote, like the role of the writer, or the, the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. Um, so that's what she thinks. Um, and I, yeah, I agree with that. I think like, as someone who doesn't identify as like an artist, I think like the role of just creative expression um, should like be to represent um, and like hold some of the more complicated, messy aspects of the human experience that like words don't really um, allow um, room to like articulate. I think in this particular moment, I was like really caught up originally wanting to make um, a short film that would like inspire other young folks who are like depressed <laughs> and don't know what to do at the end of the world. Um, and then I got caught up, really caught up in that. Like, um, it's my role to like make positive inspirational media. Um, but I don't know, I think what is like more necessary right now is like um, more authentic um, media like that um, is reflective and messy and um, I think like changing maybe like the um, dominant narrative structures that um, we are consuming in like other medias might be like a really important place for artists um, who care about social change to reflect on. Um, and I think I tried to do that in my film by not having just like a happy ending where the where I was like, yay, I, I solved the how to wake up properly and feel good all the time. Like, no, that's not what, that's not it. Um, that's not the result. Um, yeah, so I, I would say make revolution um, irresistible, but like also like, room for the messy like wild parts of it which can often be dark and necessarily so yeah um i i can really agree with milan actually i was going to use that quote so um me and milan are no longer friends um me i i curse milan but no nah, I, I i agree i, I it's weird because i feel like um the artist has so many multiple roles. I think sometimes we're healers. Sometimes we're on defense. Sometimes we make art to create bridges between different types of communities and ourselves and other people to create more solidarity. And sometimes you make art because you're like, yo, like I'm about to make something that's like, that it's going to like inspire people to like to burn some shit, you know? And, um, and like me personally, yeah, like I've, I've definitely been in places where like there's like anger behind my art. Cause I'm like, yo, like I'm about to make this, like, I want to make a lot of like mean rich people uncomfortable with this film and shit like that. And sometimes I've, and, if we're in, and I think like sometimes I've made movies where it's just kind of like, I myself want to heal. I myself want to um, change, become a different person. Cause that's the thing, right? Because social change for me, like there's, there's so many levels to it. You know, you have your institutional changes, you have the abolition of these institutions, and then you have like the creating connections. And I'm repeating the same point that I already made before. But like, yeah, I, I think like the artists, like I think our responsibility when it comes to social change is to, um, is, is to be, I had a really great conversation with somebody and they said that like um, art history is kind of like the emotional history of the world right so it's like this proof of the fact that we were here and this is what we are experiencing and i think especially within this space right um we have artists who whose backgrounds and their histories come from like colonized people and um and also ourselves here we are settlers as well even as like you know children of immigrants as well but I think it's the fact that like, and I said this in another thing that we had before, but I mean like, you know, as children of immigrants, children and ancestors of colonized people, just the act of making art is kind of like this miracle and this gigantic act of resistance to say the fact that like, according to history, you know, 
a person who looks like me shouldn't be here right now, you know, at the end of the day. Like, so I think like making art is kind of like telling people like, hey, I exist, you exist too. Let's celebrate that. Let's have fun in that. And I think like at the end of the day, I think um, what we do is that we shine a light on the things that we need to change and we need to fight against. But I think even most importantly, it's, it's sharing and showcasing what we love and what we want to defend and what we want to celebrate and, and, and why we, we try so hard to, 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 to make change and stuff like that. So I think that's, uh, that's uh, my rip on it. Yeah, I don't know who's next. Uh, Greg, have you gone, Greg? Uh, no. Great. So the role of the artist in like social change, right? Um, I, I guess I, I view being an artist a lot as kind of like a spectator role. Um, you know, like so much of like, like the human experience is such a crazy thing. And so much of it is spent making sure that like your heart keeps beating, right? Just, just staying alive. I, I do believe we're animals at the end of the day and like you're trying to to ensure your own survival right and then there's all these things going on around you and I think when you try to change social things through like policies 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 or litigation or things like that it doesn't a lot of the time it ends up making people feel like they're being attacked like their their way of living isn't right and they're you're calling them evil, which I mean, in some cases, that's true. Um, but for the sake of actually making change and not just being, you know, not, not just hoping for it, I, I think it's important to approach those differences in, in communities and different kinds of people through art, right? To show that, hey, I am a human being just like you, and these are my boundaries slash needs. You know, like, can you, can we set up a framework where, like, you share yours with me and we can all be in agreement here, you know, and I think when you try to lead those conversations through an artistic lens, whether it's two strangers sitting in front of a painting having a conversation, it, it works a lot better than, oh, who did you vote for? Oh, I voted for this person. Well, don't talk to me because we're not the same, right? I, I, I don't think, I think that there's so much conflict, especially over like the last year of seeing how polarized um, pe people are becoming over like political beliefs and, and who you're, it's like picking a team. I, I think that's really dangerous. So I think, I think the role of the artist is to, is to connect people, especially people who would not want to connect normally, right? To, to find commonality in things, whether it's just certain emotions that like, oh, I didn't know you feel sad too. I thought that was just me. Like, it sounds really silly to say, but you know, if you, you're in a community, like I'm fortunate enough to grow up in a very ethnically diverse community with all different kinds of people and all different kinds of cultures, right? Some people don't have that. Some people go the first 20, 30 years of their life before they meet um, a Caribbean person and they don't like they just have no framework to to conceptualize that or deal with that so it's it's scary and yeah so i think using art to to bridge that gap to mediate um conversations or ideas between people is like the role at least how for myself and how i look at it oh there you go thanks greg and river jordan how about you what do you think about the role of the artist in social justice and social change? Um, I don't know about all art forms, but I guess with like video making for me, it's very much storytelling. And I think traditionally in most cultures, the storytellers are the ones communicating, you know, um, truth, reality, um, culture and community and the histories, the knowledge. And so when I think of like video making for social change and TJ, it's all about just seeing what is reality and also um, showing what can be, you know, like social change, positive change. 
Um, so for me, the artist is the storyteller conveying um, the best of life that has already been lived and that will be lived. So yeah, passing on. Yes, oh, I love it. What a like, what broad breadth of answers, friends. Um, I, I could have expected that. I'm gonna just throw in, I think, um, I like echo and agree with everything that's been said. And I think that um, art can make something like uh, the concept of intersectionality, which is so, it's very complicated, necessarily so. And also it's like critically important that people, everyday people understand it and how it impacts their lives, how it influences the way they move through space and in different contexts. Uh, and I, I have experienced that art can make a concept like that accessible. So someone with a, you know, a high school education can wrap their head and heart around it. And I think that art can do that and should do that. And I think that that has to also be the role of the artist who is invested in the movement for social change, that we can make rad stuff that breaks people's brains and that we can think about and theorize about for, for days and years and decades and centuries, of course. And also that my grandmother can sit with it and work with it, you know, and that um, these can be educational tools that are sexy and yeah, I think those are the other things I would add in the mix. I feel inclined to ask y'all because like we were working with challenges. I feel like that has been one serious thread throughout this residency, right? Like we, we come at every day to our projects with like all the attention in the world and then like, oh, you can't go outside. And then like, <laughs> oh, it's the winter and you can't do your interview with your elder outside, even if you're under a bridge and dot, 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 dot. And oh, all of us like, yeah. So I feel like that's the theme. So I feel inclined to ask y'all um, what was what was one challenge or the biggest challenge you faced in creating your project and trying to make a video in the middle of a lockdown and a pandemic and a lot of violence in the world. Who would like to go first? I can start. My challenge is very simple, uh, hopefully very relatable. Um, I didn't want to go outside. I didn't feel safe outside. And so I made a film in which I did not have to go outside. Um, so passing that on. Can you, um, can I ask you just like how you did that for, for the film buffs out there or, um, you know, wannabe film buffs? How did you make a film without going outside? Um, I used archival footage, uh, which is great. It's a great way to reinterpret um, the story. I think I said earlier that I'm, all about the different human experiences. And so um, I'm, I'm using footage of um, a very important figure um, who is now deceased, the rest in, rest in power. Um, and so it's their words, but as a documentary filmmaker, I can change the narrative to convey um, a different message, which hopefully in this case will be TJ. And <laughs> so, yes. I used footage that was already already created and available, and anybody can do that to make a new story. Do you have a, an archive to shout out? Where, where can folks find that archival, not your archival footage, but if someone's gonna look for some archival footage that they might work with? Um, the archival footage that I have is, um, it belongs to Oya Media. Um, it's a private archive, so it's not available, but uh, you can try even, um, the Toronto Reference Library um, has an archive. Um, you can even use just stock footage that you find online that's, um, um, you know, um, copyright free and um, create something really cool. Okay, passing on now. Anybody else? Biggest challenge or challenges of making your video in these wild times. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go. So for me, the biggest challenge was, I mean, when we had started, the you know, intro email was something around transformative justice or art for social change were like kind of the themes we were going off of. And um, yeah, like, like River, I was very conflicted in terms of what I want to create or, or make note of and versus what I'm, I'm physically and like emotionally comfortable exposing myself to. I do live with um, my older grandfather who is not in the greatest health. So like concern of bringing COVID home to him was like really 
was was real for me, you know. Um, and but like there's so much going on right now, especially in Toronto. I I, I haven't I, I don't live in Toronto. I'm not from Brampton, but I went to Toronto once over like the past year to visit my brother, and I walked past Trinity Bellwoods and seeing all like the tents and stuff. It was really crazy because I've had walked by that park so many times before. And, you know, like I had witnessed homelessness in, in the city prior to, to COVID, but not at that level. To, so to see it that, at that um, state was like such a mismanagement from like the, the powers that be. And I really would have loved to have made something on that just because I think it might have been helpful even uh, if anyone is, there's a, a gentleman, I can't remember his name right now, but he like, had ran into legal trouble for making housing like s s small uh, portable housing for people who are like sleeping outside and I, I think if you know if, if i wasn't so nervous with my own boundaries i would have liked to have interviewed some some of these folks and you know given them like a humanizing representation because i think for a lot of the time the way we're taught about homeless people is very like, oh, they're bad, scary, stay away from them, don't don't make eye contact kind of thing. And it's like at the end of the day, these are just folks who, you know, are going through stuff just, just like anybody else. Um, that being said, the piece I ended up making, it's it's animated, it's a lot more, it's not on those issues, it's a lot more about like, I guess just mental health and kind of representing that in a in an honest and sincere way, because that was what, what I was able to do with a lot of the restrictions in terms of traveling and, and exposing myself to danger. Uh, I guess I'll go next. Um, for, yeah, I, I, I as well, I'm, I'm my grandma's primary caretaker. So uh, I really couldn't uh, find a way to get out the house to shoot, especially the other thing too, was the fact that I had just come off of another shoot when we were starting to do this and like that shoot just like completely uh wrecked me and i was just like really burnt out and stuff like that so for me it's like you know all the physical stuff of um of like the pandemic and stuff like that but for me pretty much it was um the anxiety and the depression that i go through was just like really it still is kicking my ass and um it was just really hard to to be motivated and to be artistic and to delve into myself but what ended up being is the fact that like um, the challenge of this becoming like ended up kind of like being like the, the the my challenge overall, which is the fact that I feel that in the last year since everything started, uh, I've become like really numb. And I think like one of my favorite things about myself as an artist is my ability to be vulnerable. And I felt like I was I felt like I was. Um, really holding myself back and trying to protect myself and like put walls around me and stuff like that. So I think for this piece, I did something like really, really, really simple, which is just like, it's just two pictures, uh, some music and a poem. And it's about like me processing uh, kind of like my journey, uh, the last like four or five years from film school to the pandemic and kind of reflecting on kind of like the things that like really affected me and caused that type of numbness. And it's kind of like a challenge to myself to kind of like rediscover um re rediscover um rediscover that vulnerability and, and, and to find joy in it and, and to find strength in it and stuff like that and um I think yeah that was for me it was just kind of like a really big slog against against my depression and, and trying to be open and trying to be free and that type of jazz and uh and yeah that was that was my challenge so I'll uh, I'll pass it off to me Lynn. Um, uh, my challenge was also similar to yours. I think it's a challenge that I use the film also to explore, but, um, just the challenge of like waking up productivity, like seasonal blues and, um, what happens to my body when it becomes winter and I just don't have a strong will to do anything, um, let alone be creative and produce. I think um, um, I'm I, someone who becomes energized like around people. So a lot of the isolation um, 
was like not helping getting my like creative juices flowing. So like I, I was just bouncing between some different like production ideas for this um, particular film that I wanted to make. And it was challenging like to not be around people and be energized um, and sourced by other people's um, experiences, wisdom and passion. But I think that challenge um, also became like an opportunity that was particularly um, enabled by isolation and like, yeah, the reality of this pandemic. Um, yeah, pass me back. Sweet, thanks y'all. I'll just, I'll just chime in and say, um, recording, working with Zoom content is very interesting. So I like, I did my interview with um, uh, Two Spirit, Ojibwe Elder, Blue Waters over Zoom. And yeah, there were instances where she was saying some great things. And then, you know, just the, the Zoom audio would drop out um, in the video, you know, it's, you know, you can remind a person to, to stay in the camera, but you know, there's kind of a slunch here. Anyway, these kinds of things. So like that, that's partly why I ended up doing drawings or illustrations because the video itself is like pretty low quality but the story is so good so I, I yeah I've eventually figured out a way to honor the story and um I am gonna throw it I think one last question if that's cool um and, and I'm gonna kind of riff on a question that was asked in the YouTube chat uh and <laughs> mix this into this question because I'm personally interested with your video, this piece that you made, what what are your ideals for where it ends up in the world? You know, like it's a seed on the wind. This is the truth of digital media. Um, you know, is it like you want it screened on HBO? You want it on Netflix? Do you want to be like Instagram famous with this? Um, is it like you know, film festivals? What's what's where where do you hope? What would be your ideal for where your your video might land? And why? And just jump in whenever you want. Can I start? Um, I would prefer if my video stayed like grassroots, um, stayed in community. Um, so yeah, I would prefer if it was like TikTok famous rather than on HBO, just because like the ability to spread, <laughs> yeah, maybe not TikTok, but, but um, the ability to spread between individuals. Um, and hopefully in a niche community where it can be like accepted, but also used as a starting point for um, much needed conversations and uh, facilitation of uh, positive change. Yeah. So yeah, grassroots, Just stay with the people. Okay, spread from one to one. Uh, passing on. I'll take it. Um, I think for me, uh, this movie's just for me, really. This movie was just for like me to be like, this is me one on one with the depression. See how far we can go. Um, like, yeah, this was like a big fuck you to my depression for me. Um, like, I don't really, I didn't really make this. Not to say that I don't make movies for film festivals, nor am I trying to make a career or try to pay my OSEP off with filmmaking one day. And not to say that I, you know, one day what I would like to be making Avengers twenty five. Yes, of course. But um, this movie in particular is just for me. And I think it's, um, but that's the beauty of, 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 of um, and I think that's the weird thing about film because as, in film, you really uh, walk a line of being an uh, artist and entertainer, you know? But also too, there's nothing wrong with being an entertainer either, you know? Cause there's a lot of beauty and joy and like making people laugh, making people cry, making them feel things and stuff like that, you know? And, and for me personally, like, uh, like, you know, I do understand, like, you know, Marvel and, and Disney are these gigantic capitalistic machines and propaganda machines. I know that 110%. But also the fact that like, you know, working class people go to the movies on Tuesdays, you know, like I grew up the son of superintendent and a superintendent and a cleaning lady. I grew up on like Kung Fu and Pixar movies. That's when I went to the movie theater. You know, that's how I was spoken to. You know, so I think it's like, uh, I think for me, like my end goal is to be like, how do I bring like, I guess I know it's dated Natty, it's burning in the chat right now. 
I'm trying, I'm talking about my childhood right now, but, um, but yeah, no, I, but I think the goal is the fact that, you know, um, I want to be like a conniving piece of shit who is just like sliding like this trans messages of transformative justice in big box office movies. That's the goal. That's the goal, you know, but, but with this piece here, it's just for me. And I think it's just important to, and also I think it is really important to just, just make shit for yourself and uh hopefully and, and and hopefully people connect with it and with that being said i now pass it off to greg thank you um so the question is like where would we like this this piece specifically to end up um I, I would really love for this to be like a video installation that would be like the the peak you know i think some of my best experiences going to um, the galleries or, or physical, physically shown art pieces are like where it's a, it's a space that creates a sense of like, oh, we can have not typical day-to-day -day conversations here, right? Like I, I've walked into rooms with total strangers and just had conversations like, oh, why don't you kill yourself? And not, not like telling them they should, but like what stops you from doing that? Like what motivates you to stay alive? And like very sincere, meaningful conversations with people I, I would never know otherwise, right? Just because we're sitting in a space where there's like some kind of strange piece of art or video and it brings out, I think that sense of like, I can be very candid here and, and vulnerable. And I, I, would, I would love for it to be like a video installation. It's just like a room and it's looping it and there's like, you can just walk in and out, you know, because I, I, it's not something, if you have commitment issues, you don't have to sit down and like lock into it. You can just kind of pass through it and uh, do your thing. Um, I would love to see your piece, Greg, like if someone would hack the Dundas Square freaking panels <laughs> and just like, <laughs> <laughs> that would be so cool. Um, I echo River Jordan. I feel like my piece would be most impactful and it, important to just share with like friends and family and within the within Toronto. So probably just sharing on Instagram and stuff like that. I think local is really important. Yeah. And it's just that type of piece that I'm like, let me just share with my friends and family. Well, how about you? Um, um, it's like, I, okay, so part of me wants to, like, I would want to see this I actually want to see, I would want it to spread as wide as it can possibly spread, you know, as wide as the, 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 net, the net can cast. Um, but also at the same time, I, I feel like there's like a, yeah, like at the, same, at the same time, I feel, I feel like there's a, I feel like there's a, there's a particular presence that my video gives when you watch it alone. Like when you watch it alone in like a quiet space, kind of like to yourself. Um, and I feel like, that's kind of how, that's definitely kind of how I want to really share it. Um, like whether that's like through social media or maybe it's like a, it's a late night and you're just kind of, you just can't go to sleep. So you're just scrolling around and you see this video and you kind of watch it to yourself with the lights off and kind of things like that. Um, Cause I, I feel like even like, I feel like for me, like when I, whenever I watch it and I've watched it in the in creating it I watched it many many times um but in this like as I watch it I kind of like I I think it definitely provokes a lot of like a lot of thought and just kind of like self I like, yeah, yeah just like self-thought and I feel like that's really good to do and you get and you get some real quality thinking when you're kind of like to yourself um and I also feel like I've yeah I feel like the message that it portrays is something that I don't necessarily want to kind of just be like missed kind of just like shown and then you kind of go about your everyday type of thing um yeah so I think like I'm open to wherever it shows but wherever it does show I just want it to be in a kind of like a 
uh, quiet sort of like, yeah, secluded space. Um, but yeah, that's, that's me. <laughs> Love it. Okay. How about you, Natty? Ooh, thank you for asking. Um, well, I, I'll say like, um, I have like much of what I've learned about transformative justice, I would say has come from indigenous communities and in practice with indigenous communities, two-spirit communities and with LGBTQ communities. Um, and uh, Blue is a dear, is a friend and a mentor and an elder. And there's a few other folks I interviewed for this project, but I don't know anyone who's ever done animation. It takes a long time. <laughs> it takes a really long time. Um, so I'm not there yet, but I, I, I want those videos to be resources to young indigenous and two-spirit folks. Um, because I think that there is just there's so much wisdom there um, and I think uh, indigenous and two-spirit folks don't necessarily get like acknowledged enough for in particular in Canada how much they've contributed to the healing justice and transformative justice movement in terms of principles and practices um, and yeah and like I mean yeah that just that little teaching is just one like four minutes of a, an hour-long interview with Blue that is all just brilliant so I want to share it with them I want them to be able to use it in their education work and um hope similarly like grassroots community organizing probably some workshops to trainings in transformative justice so 755 we are gonna wrap at eight i um i feel inclined like if anyone has any closing remarks that they can do in 30 seconds the floor is open and then we'll do a little closing I would just like to say um, thank you to the other um, artists whose voices um, and poems I used in my piece. So um, Sosana, Chloe, and Maria, um, they're all folks who in different mediums, um, I think are working um, to collectively heal um, and connect folks together. So I was, it was a pleasure to use their voices and stories I want, uh, I want to say uh, big, big ups to uh, Ezra, who uh, can't be here, right? who isn't here right now. Um, I don't know why that sounds like they passed away or something. They're not. They're, they're alive and healthy, very much so. But uh, yeah, they've, um, they're a beautiful soul, an amazing filmmaker, amazing human being. Uh, kind of feels like we're not the same without them. And I just want to say thank you uh, to everybody, uh, part of the residency and everybody who uh, sat down and spent this time with us. And we love you very, very, very much. Although I've never met you, but you're beautiful. So yeah, anyone else want to say something before I make a fool out of myself, please? Um, so, thank you, River. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to say thank you to the circle, not just the usual one, but the virtual one we created through um, YouTube very healing process it's been a very interesting few months um, especially when I think that when we started there was no COVID vaccine so we're on our way I guess um and yeah uh, oh and to sketch of course and our, our funders our invisible funders uh, so thank you everyone um, I, would, I know we didn't get to get through a lot of the questions and the comments. Uh, so, sorry, we're a bit short on time due to some technical issues. But um, one that I just wanna touch on is because somebody had expressed like that they're creator artists themselves and they're, if you're feeling overwhelmed by difficulties or like luck is such a big factor and it's like, well, I'm not gonna, when do I get my big break? Like just keep going to things and just keep signing up for stuff. Cause you only need to be right once, right? And then, and then you're good. You know, just keep exposing yourself to situations where you could meet that person who will, you know, might change your life, or, or you could get that that gig that would really boost your uh, your your audience. Just just keep trying, you know. Like even the way I found Sketch, I I went to an event. I was trying to go to an event near Sketch, and they wouldn't let me in because I, I was dressed like this, and they said no, we can't let you in, sir. So I was like, oh crap. And then I walked away and I, I just hung out at Sketch for a bit and uh, I had ran into Sarah who's in the chat and then she we talked for a bit and then you know a couple of months later here I am you know I got two hours in the season Sketch that was that was luck I, I would say but you know I hadn't you know taken the 
two and a half hour commute to the city to go to that event, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have uh, been here. You know, just keep putting yourself in situations where, where lucky things can happen to you and then eventually you'll get there. And thank you everybody for their time coming out. It's a lot, appreciate it. Yeah, hold on, I got one minute, oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> Um, I just want to, uh, yeah, I just want to give a big thank you to, to everybody, um, everyone watching, everyone that has been through, who's been a part of this residency for this, like, yeah, six months. Um, yeah, it's been a long time and there's been a lot of like just amazing conversations, discussions, and I feel like just like, yeah, just like personal sharing. Um, yeah, like, <laughs> um, Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> I feel like I'm like tearing up a little. Um, no, 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 no. Stop. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I just, I just want, yeah. Just a big thank you to everybody, you know. Um, and like, yeah. Shameless, uh, uh shameless little promo there. Like, uh, Toronto Tiny Shelters. Follow them on Instagram. Um, yeah. Like they're doing amazing things. And yeah, that's, that's all I have to say, really. I'm gonna riff <laughs> on that. These artists are gonna post their um IG. Uh, info in the YouTube chat in case you want to check any of them out. Um, and I also want to just say, you know, these videos are located within a movement of transformative justice and abolition. And there's a lot happening in Toronto and so-called Canada. So plug in if you want to learn. Shout out to Sketch for their many years of TJ work, Justice for Children and Youth, Written House, Toronto Prisoners Rights Project, defundthepolice.ca, an, an enormous campaign, Black Lives Matter TO, Not Another Black Live, the National Abolition Coalition, the Encampment Support Network, and so many other folks who are working with TJ and Harm Reduction in their good work. Hope to see you on the front lines, friends, in the grassroots.